I'm going to be reading from uh, Luke chapter 12, uh, 41 through I think it's 48. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling me this parable to us or to everyone? And the Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the manager puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It would be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time coming. And then he begins to beat the men servants and maid servants to eat, drink, and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour when he's not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That servant knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. But from the one who has been entrusted uh, with much, much more will be asked. Parables. I think we, uh, most of us understand parables. Uh, we understand parables in light of today sometimes. We'll use an illustration or something to, to tell a story. Uh, oftentimes we'll do that to teach our children. Jesus did that quite often as he was teaching. He often taught in parables. And, and I've read countless articles and even some whole books that have attempted to explain why did Jesus use parables. And uh, and I, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, but uh, some say, uh, most of them come to similar conclusions about it, but some say that the average person in the day of Jesus was so far removed from the teachings of the law that he couldn't just go through and quote the law because they no longer studied the scriptures like they used to, and, and so that wouldn't have worked for the average person. I'm, I'm not sure that's accurate. Uh, some would say that, uh, that by this point, People had forgotten much of what Moses had taught, and so he would have had to reteach everything anyway, so he used the parables in lieu of reteaching the law, and I don't think that's very accurate either. Others would say that by using parables, he was able to avoid open conflict with either the civil or the religious authorities because they couldn't specifically say he was talking about us, he was just telling a story. And maybe there's some truth that what I really think and what most would agree, I think, is that he used parables because everyday people could remember the point of the lesson if he nailed it down with a parable about something they could understand. He used it so that people could understand what he was saying. That's why he used parables. It's the same way and the same reason preachers today use illustrations when we, when we preach our sermons. If, if Jesus told a parable to illustrate his sermons, maybe we ought to do that occasionally too, is to tell something to help people understand or remember it. And uh, if he's the greatest teacher of all time, I'd like to follow his example a little bit. You know, some people don't think so. Just give me the Bible only. Don't explain it. Well, that might be fine for a Bible scholar. You know, uh, some, some Bible scholars, that's all they need. Others, and I'll put myself in the others category here, sometimes we need somebody to explain to us what I read. You know the 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 narrative in the gospel of or in the in the gospel the narrative in the book of Acts says that as the eunuch was traveling down the road, here's a scholar who's studying the word of God fervently, and he Philip comes up to him and says, "Understandest thou what thou readest?" That's the way it says it in the King James version. That's the way I learned it way back when. And he says, "How can I unless someone explain it to me?" And so Philip joined himself to the chariot. He explained to him, beginning at that same scripture, 
the gospel of Christ, and the eunuch came to full understanding. He needed help understanding what he read. Sometimes I need help understanding what I read. Sometimes others need help. I've had people ask me, hey, do you have anything on such and such? I, I had one of those requests just recently. I'm like, yep, I do. Let's, we'll, we'll borrow a resource and we'll look at a resource and see what someone has written about it and see what we can learn from it and about it. So that's why I think Jesus used parables because sometimes if he could drive a story home, we'd remember the lesson that we learned from it. You know, way back when, Aesop did that with fables to try to drive points home so that people could learn morality or things like that. And as I stated before, Jesus often taught in parables. Now sometimes, preachers can get so caught up in illustrations that they never use scripture. I don't think Jesus was at either one of those extremes. I don't think he used only scripture, and I don't think he used only parables when he taught. As a matter of fact, uh, he taught in plain everyday language that left no question sometimes. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. I mean, this is pretty clear stuff. He said, you've heard it said, I've got that on the, one of the slides up there. There you go. You've heard it said that it was, or you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He wasn't telling a parable there. He was pretty straightforward in what he had to say. Here it is. Here's where the, here's where the tires meet the pavement. This is it. This is real. This is solid. You better pay attention to what I've got to say because these words are valuable and important. It's not a story. To get your attention, it's an in-your-face teaching by Jesus. Again, in, uh, in, Math, in Mark chapter 12 and verse 17, Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. They marveled at him because they were trying to trick him, and, and he just gave them an answer that was, wait. Well, you can't question that teaching. He just gave them a straightforward answer. Now, here today again, he's talking in parables. Sometimes he used parables. Sometimes he spoke directly to the needs of the people or to the things they needed to hear. Remember Luke chapter 10? When the lawyer asked Jesus, wanting to justify himself, it says, Who then is my brother? Jesus told him a parable. We love that parable. It's one of the parables that we've carried down through the years. It's one of the favorite parables of people throughout the history of the Bible. We call it the parable of the Good Samaritan that we find there in Luke chapter 10. We've used it to teach our kids for 2,000 years, to teach them about being kind to others. The world has used it, and, and, and the, in fact, the ideology of this particular parable has motivated people to stand up against evil and injustice and to fight to free people from oppression for two s centuries? No, not centuries. Two millennia. For 2,000 years, people have fought against injustice and oppression because they saw in this simple teaching of Jesus a story about someone who really cared. And someone who really cared doesn't just go by and look and say, Oh, wow, I'm sad that this has happened. Somebody who really cares does something about it. And so that parable of Jesus has endured these 2,000 years to the whole world, not just in the church. And so this morning, as we look at another of Jesus' parables, let's not dismiss it as just another story, but let's learn from it as he intended for us to. Let's not take it as something literal because it wasn't intended as such, but let us, in fact, learn from it from the way he intended for us too. And from our parable, we're going to learn three things today. We're going to learn that Jesus is coming back. We're going to learn that when he comes back, he's going to reward those who are faithful. And we're going to learn that when Jesus comes back, he's going to punish or condemn those who are unfaithful. As a matter of fact, I think in some of your versions it says curse rather than condemn. He's going to curse or punish those who are not faithful. The first thing we see is that the Lord's coming back. That's a theme of Scripture. I think sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we, we, you know, 
we'll, we'll sing the song, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. And what we mean is, well, soon, someday down the road. It'll be soon when he actually comes. But a lot of times, as we talked about last week, we don't think soon is going to happen during our lifetime, or at least not in our immediate lifetime. And yet, as we read through the Bible, as we read through the New Testament, as we read through the book of Revelation, the letters by John and by Paul, oftentimes we see in there the theme, even so, Lord, come quickly. That's the way the book of Revelation ends. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. They're looking for a soon return of Jesus. As a matter of fact, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes, the Thessalonican church was so sure that Jesus was coming very, very soon that many of them quit their jobs. They quit their jobs and they were sitting on the rooftop waiting for Jesus to come back. They believed Jesus was coming soon. We'll talk about that again in just a minute. This parable, as does many of Jesus' other parables, begins with a question. Peter looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? I think some of your translations will say for everybody. Uh, and Jesus answers and gives the parable in response. And, you know, we need to be aware that he is coming. You know, we should always be aware. It should motivate us. It should motivate us tremendously. I remember growing up, if my dad was out of town, now, my dad got paralyzed when I was 11 years old, so these are memories from before I was 11 years old, but if my dad was working and I had done something right or wrong, I was watching for my dad to be there. If I was pitching that day, I was looking forward to my dad showing up at my game. That's, that was something I was looking forward to. I wanted to see him. As a matter of fact, as I went out onto the field, I would look and see if my dad was in the stands. You know, that's, that's something that, that, that I expected, I wanted to see. If I had done wrong, and my mom had told me, you just wait till your dad gets home, I did not want to see him pull up. That yellow truck was the most horrifying sight in the world. When that yellow truck pulled up, I knew I was about to die. <sighs> or at least wish I was for a little while. Yeah, we should always be aware that the Lord is coming, and we should anticipate that and live like we expect it. That's what we ought to be doing. It would motivate us to a point where it altered our lifestyle. Again, at the Thessalonican church, as, we, as, as I mentioned a while ago, it was so prevalent they had ceased to work. They're sitting on the rooftops, and they're waiting for Jesus to come back, and they're not working, and they're, they're there. But guess what happens when you sit there and you wait? You get hungry. So they would have to get food from somebody else because they're not working. And Paul had to warn the church in Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, If a man will not work, neither shall he eat. You need to go back to work. You need to provide for yourself. You need to take care of your needs. You need to meet all these needs. Yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, you need to be prepared for Jesus is coming. Yes, Jesus is coming back. Yes, you need to be prepared for Jesus to come back. But in the meantime, you have to take care of the needs of the day. And I think sometimes people get so, old phrases, so heavenly minded that they become no earthly good. We ought to be heavenly minded. We ought to be looking forward to the return of Jesus. We ought to be eagerly anticipating his coming. But we have to continue along the way. Can you imagine if your grandparents, your grandparents, had decided, Jesus is coming back any day, there's no need to teach our children morality. There's no need to teach our grandchildren anything about Jesus because Jesus is going to come back before they get here anyway. And you had been raised by people who never taught you right and wrong or right from wrong. And you had been raised by people who had never given you the hope of eternal life. How tragic that would be in the world. How tragic that would be if we were to do that to our own children and grandchildren. But rather, knowing and anticipating his second coming, we warn and plead with others 
so that they too can come to know the mercy and the grace of our Lord. Well, that's scripture. That's scripture. That's what we're supposed to do. We should always be aware of that. But what does the Bible say about that? I mean, I, I said it's the, the New Testament is replete with, with teachings that Jesus is coming again. But, but listen to some of these. Luke 12 and 35 from last week. He told them to stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be ready at any time. No matter when. The parable of the ten virgins tells us that five of them were ready. Not only were they ready, they were ready in case it was delayed for a little while. Do you remember that? They had extra oil just in case. Five of them weren't ready. Well, if he comes right now, I'm ready. But, but this long, this staying faithful even to death is a whole lot harder than becoming faithful for a little while. You know, I, 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 think, that, I think that's one of the problems with that philosophy that some have of, of once saved, always saved. Well, if you're once saved and you're always saved, then you don't have to worry about being faithful all the time. You can just let, mark that off your list. That's not what the Bible teaches. Matter of fact, the first person ever to say, you will not surely die, once saved, always saved, was Satan in the Garden of Eden. It's one of his doctrines. It's not one of God's. But that's one of the problems we have here as we look at this text sometimes. Stay dressed for action. Be ready at any time. Jesus could come at any moment when we're not expecting it. And so we need to be ready at all the time. Paul told the church at Thessalonica to comfort one another with these words. Here are the words. He said, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So will we always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And in verse 18, he says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. I think I'm a whole verse ahead of you or two. That's okay. Uh, I'm at uh, John 14, 3 is the next one. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, this is Jesus talking to his apostles, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We use this a lot of times at funerals. It's one of those passages that gives us comfort. Jesus saying, where I am, there you may be also. It's an important thing. But there's another important part of it. There's another important part of it. Jesus begins the thing with, don't be troubled. Jesus begins the thing with a promise that he is coming back. He promises that. In another place, he says, no one takes my life away from me. I lay it down of my own free will. And if I lay it down... I have the power to take it up again. He, he challenges them on that. He lets us know he's coming back again. He wants us to understand that. In Revelation 1 and verse 7, John writes, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. He's coming again. He's coming again. The scriptures are full of references to Jesus' second coming. We need to know that. We need to be prepared for that. We sing the song, Jesus is coming soon. We don't know when, but he's coming. And to that end, we need to ask, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come again? Do you have enough oil in your lamp to last? Are you prepared for that? Are you sitting there anxiously anticipating the return of the Lord if he came back right now, right this minute, right in the middle of while we're talking to each other right now, if he came back right this very second, would you say, yes, Lord, it's good to see you, I've been waiting. Or would you say, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on just a minute. I got some things I need to get off my chest first. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. He's coming. We need to be ready. The second thing that we learn from this parable is that Jesus is going to reward those he finds faithful. He's going to reward those he finds faithful. Luke 12, 
42 and four, through 44 in our reading this morning says, The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll set him over all his possessions. You know, if we're following Christ and we're looking forward to his return, we're looking forward also to a reward at the end of that time. I am. Remain faithful till death and he'll give us a crown of righteousness. Is that what you want? I want to be found righteous at death. I want to be found with Jesus at death. Those of us that are following Christ are looking forward to this reward. We, we, we read of a place that's called heaven. We do. We sing about it. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. No more tears, no sorrow, no pain. And, but most of us are looking forward to something much greater than that in heaven. Most of us are looking forward to being reunited with loved ones who have gone on ahead. I look forward to seeing my mom again. I look forward to meeting my great-grandfather who I never got to know because he died before I was born. I look forward to all that, but you know what I really look forward to? I think most of us do. Don't you look forward to seeing Jesus face to face? Don't you look forward to going to Jesus and telling him, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You don't have to show me the nails in your palms. I believe. You don't have to show me the hole in your side. I believe that too. I'd apply the ointment myself if I could. I love you so much and I want to see you. We ought to be honestly, and I think we are honestly, striving and looking forward to that day. What does the Bible teach about it? Well, Matthew 24, 45 through 47 says, Who then is this wise and faithful? Faithful and wise servant whom the master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll set him over all his possessions. Sound familiar? Sounds almost exactly like what we just read in Luke. It does, doesn't it? It's because Jesus said it because it's important. So we repeated it. It's repeated in our Bibles because it's important. It's something important for us to understand. Set over all his possessions. You know, when I read about Jesus telling his apostles they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes, and I read about that, and, I, and somebody says, well, you know what's going to happen is God's going to put us over dominions and, th and power and, and authorities and such like, and angels are going to be serving us. That doesn't appeal to me very much. That's so far beyond my comprehension that I, I just can't see that. But the idea... That God's going to let me come into his presence? That does appeal to me as I look at that. 2 Timothy 2 and 15, we're supposed to do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who needs not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We're supposed to study God's word to show ourselves approved. Study God's word, not just read it. Although reading it's important, faith comes from hearing the word of God, Romans 10 and 17. But we should be studying God's word. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Sometimes when we read it, I, I don't know, I said it earlier. Sometimes when we read it, it's not easy to understand. Peter writes of Paul that Paul writes some things which are difficult to understand. If it was hard for Peter to understand, I guess it would be okay for me to have a little difficulty understanding. Because Peter was there. Uh, maybe Peter being a fisherman made it harder. He wasn't as educated as Paul was. And maybe Paul was using bigger words than what Peter was used to using. And maybe that's why it was difficult for him to understand. I don't know. I just know that there are times when I need to study and understand what the scriptures say. Because sometimes you can take a verse out of context and make it say something that it doesn't say. You know, one of my favorites on those is uh, a friend of mine, Bob McDonald. He likes to go, he likes to go, you know... Well, seven different times in the scriptures. And if it's seven, that means it's important. Paul says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. Well, those words are in there. But that's not what it means. In each one of those cases, he said, I would not have you ignorant of the resurrection. I would not have you ignorant of the love for one another. I would not have you ignorant of the plans of God. But if you just take that little part out of context, you can make it say something else. So we need to study it, not just read it. 
but study it so that we have it in context and we understand what it says. 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Whoever keeps his word, ooh, keeps his word. That's important, sounds like. In him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So in other words, if we're going to say we are Christians, if we're going to use that term Christian, meaning of Christ or in Christ, we ought to be walking like Jesus did and we ought to be keeping his word. We ought to be obeying what he says. When he says that part we read earlier about anger and hating our brothers and things like that and that we shouldn't do that, then we shouldn't do that, right? When he says that part about rendering to Caesar those things that belong to Caesar and rendering to God the things that belong to God, we ought to be doing that, right? That's walking in keep with him or walking in step with him. And that's the words that are used here. Yes, our reward is coming. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's the home of the good and the free. Good, good meaning not sinless and perfect, but forgiven and tried and tested. Free meaning not without any obligations in the world, but meaning free from the guilt and the consequences of sin. That's who's going to be in heaven. Those who have been tried and tested, who've been forgiven, and no longer bear the consequences of their sin that they did commit. Oh, that's why I want to be in heaven. There's going to be some good people there, some wonderful people there. That's the reward we have for following Jesus. And he tells us that here as he tells this parable. But then he goes on and he talks about what's going to happen to those that are unfaithful. He says the Lord's going to curse them or punish them. Luke 12, verses 45 through 48 says, If that servant says to himself, My master's delayed in coming. And begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day he doesn't expect him and an hour he doesn't know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required, and from whom to whom they had trusted much, they will demand the more. By the way, we said something about that once saved, always saved doctrine there. You see what we have here at the very beginning of this part? That servant, that servant says, my master is delayed in coming. In the end of verse 46, he's going to be cut in pieces and put with the unfaithful. Who was it? It was the servant. It was the one that was in charge of things. It was the one that was already blessed. It was the one that was already saved, if you will, who did not remain faithful, who was being cut up and cast out. I think we must always remember the Bible teaches truth. And Jesus' words teach truth. But look at the character of this guy. Look at his character. He's cruel. I mean, he's not just not kind. I mean, I know people that are they're not very kind. They're not very nice, but they're not necessarily cruel. This guy's cruel. He's, he, the, you know, the fruit of the Spirit includes kindness. And the fruit of this guy is meanness. He intentionally is trying to inflict as much harm as he can on others. That's what it says. He's beating the others. He's abusing the others. He's taking advantage of his position to make their lives miserable. That's the kind of guy this guy is. He's sensual. He's sensual. All he cares about is what he wants and what brings him pleasure. That's all he cares about. His life's about serving his own desires. You know, he give me what I want, give me what I want, give me more of what I want. And that's all his life is about. And, and again, far from the self-control that's part of the fruit of the Spirit, he's full of selfishness which is part of the fruits of evil. You know, all he cares about, what can I get out of it? What's in it for me? And that's what his life is all about. And he's arrogant. He thinks he's in control. Well, the master's not here. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. You know, I, I, I was watching a program one time, and I, it's, it's been many years, and I don't remember what TV program it was, but somebody came in and, and they wanted to talk to the manager, and the manager wasn't there, and they said, well, I need to talk to somebody that's in charge. And this, 
this boy that looked like he's about 14 or 15 said, well, that'd be me because he left me in charge. Well, obviously, he didn't have any authority whatsoever, but he sure thought he did. He thought he could run the whole program because he was the one that was in charge. The problem is the master's going to come at a time when this guy least expects it. The master's going to show up when he least expects it. And that's something that's going to happen. And there's going to be punishment there. The Lord will cut him off. You know, it, it says chop him into pieces in some translations. In others it says, says he will cut him off. I, I think the, the literal idea here in the, as we read through it, especially if we read through it in, in the Greek text, the idea is that he's going to be severed from his relationships more than he's going to be cut up into little pieces. He's going to be punished. He's going to be punished. And, and, and that's going to happen to people that aren't faithful. So what does the scripture teach about that? Is that consistent with the rest of scripture? In John 3, in verse 19, Jesus says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Wow. Doesn't it sound like this guy Jesus is talking about? The one that's abusing and beating the servants and going out and getting drunk and taking his own pleasure? He loves the evil rather than the light. He's not looking forward to the light. He's enjoying his time in the sun. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You know, we have to do his will. It's not enough just to know it. It's not enough just to give lip service to our relationship with God. We have to actually live for him. And he will live in us. Matthew 24, 43 and following. But know this. If the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give him their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. You know, he says there's going to be punishment. He warns us that we need to be ready. He encourages us to be ready. He encourages us with a reward for those of us who are found ready. And then he warns us about not being ready. How sad it would be if we're entrusted with so great a gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven, lived on earth, died on a cross was buried in the ground, was raised again on the third day, so that those of us who believe in him, who hope in him, who trust in him, who obey him, can have hope of eternal life. How sad it would be if those of us entrusted with this wonderful, precious gospel of Christ were to not be ready when the Lord comes back. Well, George, you know, I... Just that whole, that whole thing about obedience, I, I, I know it says it, but, but, you know, I need to get my life in order before I, before I can become a Christian. Well, you know, I need to get my life in order before I can come back to the church. I need to get my life in order before I can do this or that or the other thing. Let me tell you something. You cannot get your life in order without Christ. You can't. You can't do it alone. Oh, Satan will be glad to let you try. You can make a million dollars and not be a Christian. I don't know. I saw the, just a few minutes ago when I was driving down the highway. Apparently, you can make $850 million if you just go buy a $2 ticket. That looks, wow. Yeah, you could be a millionaire and never be a Christian. But you know what? Jesus is coming. And he's going to reward those that are found faithful. And he's going to punish those that are not found faithful. And that's true. And it's much more likely than winning the lottery. Because it's guaranteed 100%. Perhaps this morning, you need to make your life right. Maybe you're not ready if Jesus comes back. You need to be ready. That's the whole point of both last week and this week's parables. Is that we need to be ready at whatever time. Because we know not the time when he's coming. 
If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come while we stand and sing a song?